So unfortunately, we are now heading into the first international break of the season, but heading in after six games played, that is how the championship table is lining up. So the top two we've got of Swansea City and Charlton Athletic, both have started the season out excellently. Tomorrow I'll have my video coming out for my August championship team of the month, and we've got some interesting selections to go through in there. But before we do get into anything for today's video, I will include your guys' score predictions on screen now. So if any of you did successfully manage to get any of your predictions correct, then fair play. I managed to get two of mine correct this weekend, both the Luton and Preston game. Apologies if my voice does sound a little bit dodgy for today's video. I've got a bit of a cold at the moment, but we'll brave through that for today's video. And without any further ado, let's hop into talking about some of these games. So starting out with Friday night's game between Cardiff and Fulham. This one ending as a 1-1 draw. Now, in terms of a spectacle, it wasn't the best game going on this weekend. I think that most people would agree with that. Cardiff took the lead in the 42nd minute. A nice finish from Josh Murphy after he was slipped through. Could have squared it to Glatzel, but took the goal by himself. I mentioned him in the previous video. I think that he will be Cardiff most potent attacking threat throughout this season. Possibly Benelli could have done a little bit better with the goal. You know, he did get down to it, but it just managed to squirm over him. Not long after that, though, Fulham did equalise going into half-time. Mitrovic outstrengthened Sean Morrison in midfield. He got the ball out wide and a nice ball put across by Cavallero. Mitrovic ghosted in at the far post and had a tap in to make it 1-1. The controversy started in the second half, though, when Harry Arthur was sent off for a second yellow card. An awful dive, let's be real. I don't know what he was playing at. It was quite embarrassing, really, and justifiably, he was sent off, and Fulham were down to 10 men for the last 20 minutes. Fulham had a lot of possession, but after getting the man sent off, I think that they'll be happy with the point. Towards the end, Sean Morrison did have a decent chance to win it with a header, which just went wide, so finishing as a 1-1 draw, in the end, given the circumstances, it's not the worst result for either side. Into Saturday's games, we then had Bristol City drawing 2-2 with Middlesbrough. This one actually being a really good watch, some good football on display for this one. Both sides hit the post in the first half. Benica Fobe also had a very good chance, which Darren Randolph managed to palm away but Bristol City did take the lead just before half time some fantastic skill from Eliasson down the left wing Paddy McNair tried to stand him up but he still managed to get his cross in and Casey Palmer was on hand to make it 1-0 to Bristol City Middlesbrough were looking good going forward in the second half though after an own goal from Tyler Moore Brett Sombolonga put them two on the head with a really nice finish after he'd been slipped to the own goal and from that point onwards this game was really open in the second half Bristol City did get back with Tommy Rowe equalising this time some nice work from Calamo Dowder to get the ball into the box both of Bristol City's goals were fairly similar for this one with some nice skill down the wing, the ball put in and then a nice header into the back of the net but really either side could have won it from this show and I thought that they both played well for spells. Middlesbrough I thought looked better than they had done in previous weeks and Bristol City have been consistently picking up results lately so overall it's not a bad point for either side. Then we have Birmingham beating Stoke by two goals to one. I'd be interested to get some Stoke fans opinions of what you make of Nathan Jones at the moment. How much longer do you think he's got left in the job? If results do carry on like this they will be going into the international break sat bottom of the championship. Before they did take the lead, they probably had the better chances. You know, Lee Gregory in the first half, they hit the post in the second. Joe Allen had the chance to follow it in, but couldn't sort his feet out quick enough. Eventually, Liam Lindsay did give Stoke the lead, but that was then cancelled out by Lucas Djukovic. If they hang the ball up to the far post, Djukovic is one of the best strikers in the league to have in that area. And then 16-year-old Jude Bellingham was able to make it 2-1 after the help of a deflection, I think becoming Birmingham's youngest ever goal scorer. And there were some decent limbs after that goal did go in. It sort of papered over the cracks over what was not really the greatest performance from Birmingham either though, but not playing well, but still picking up all three points, is something that Stoke just haven't been able to do this season. You get the impression lately that Nathan Jones is starting maybe to panic a little bit, you know, he's sort of diverged away from his system. Stoke have been trying out a few things recently, which haven't necessarily been clicking for them, and at the moment, just nothing's working for them. And then we have Brentford beating Derby by three goals to nil. Now, honestly, this one could have been much worse, and this performance, I think, was coming from Brentford. Before this weekend, they'd only scored two goals in the championship. However, they had been creating a hell of a lot of chances per game. It's just that nothing was really sticking for them going forward. So they were due a performance like this and Derby County were on the receiving end of it. Albeit Derby were nowhere to be seen in this game. You know, they didn't have a shot on target. After Ollie Watkins had had a chance clear off the line by Richard Keogh, they managed to follow that in. Soon after that, Ollie Watkins did get his first and Brentford's second in the game in the 18th minute. A really nice slick counter-attacking move for that one. Three passes and that Derby defence was absolutely opened up. And then before half-time, Ollie Watkins managed to make it 3-0 to Brentford. Ben Rama was back in the starting 11 for Brentford for this one he was making Derby players look silly at times in terms of Derby I think they've got two really good strikers at the club in Jack Murray and Martin Wycorn but they've not really got any creativity in that midfield they've got no sort of progressive passes and you can tell that they are really missing a player like Mason Mount from last season and then we saw Swansea beat Leeds by one goal to a massive statement at the top of the championship although I must admit Leeds were brilliant throughout this game you know in terms of their intensity on and off the ball they were playing Swansea around they had no trouble creating chances it was just putting them away was the real issue for Leeds and we saw that a couple 
couple instances throughout last season as well. You know, the first half leads definitely had the better of it. Hernandez, Dallas, Bamford, and Ketia when he came on all had chances for this game, but nothing was quite sticking for Leeds. And the longer that Swansea were able to hold on in this game, the longer you thought that maybe they would get something from it. But credit to Swansea, they defended absolutely brilliantly for this one. You know, Joe Roden, absolutely excellent. And then they got that goal in the 90th minute with Routledge stepping up to give Swansea all three points and send them top of the table going into the international break. So what a start to the season it has been from Swansea. For Leeds, it was a frustrating result, but there was still a lot of elements about their performance to like. And then we had Luton beating Huddersfield by two goals to one. Luton claiming back-to-back -back wins in the championship and have set them up fairly well going into the international break. The same can't be said for Huddersfield, who at the moment are on the worst run of form in the league. They've lost their last four matches now. And quite similar to Stoke City, they did take the lead in this game. Colin Grant, once again, being the poacher on the spot to give Huddersfield the lead in the second half. That lead was only to last for 10 minutes, though Luton equalised from the penalty spot. The penalty itself did look to be a little bit soft for me, but nevertheless, Collins excellently slotted it away into the bottom corner. And then 10 minutes later, Andrew Shinney made it 2-1 to Luton Town with an excellent finish from outside the box. He had a little bit of space and picked out the far post brilliantly. Luton are one of the sides so far who have got into double figures, four goals scored so far in six games. They've scored 10. And I thought they reacted really well to going one goal behind in this game. Huddersfield at the moment, I mean, they got a little bit of time now to sort out their situation with the manager over the international break. Interestingly enough, Van La Parra has been sold to Red Star Belgrade. Huddersfield fans, let me know what you make of that departure down below. At the moment, things just haven't been clicking for them at all. Then we have Millwall drawing 1-1 with Hull City. Hull gave away a little bit of a sloppy penalty early on in this one. Wallace absolutely smashed that home to make it 1-0 to the home side. But that was levelled out by an absolutely fantastic free kick from Drasitsky. His first goal of the season. I don't think that Bill Karski was expecting a shot, but it just looped over his head. The goalkeeper was made to look a bit a little bit silly. But great technique from Drasitsky, who can have those little bursts of quality. Kevin Stewart had a brilliant chance to give Hull the lead, but somehow managed to squander a shot from inside the six-yard box. For the second half, it was mostly Millwall who were pushing for that winner. They were swinging a lot of balls into the box, but just couldn't quite get on in the end of anything. In the 93rd minute, Hull were then reduced to 10 men, a little bit silly from Josh McGuinness, but there wasn't anything to separate the two sides come full time. We then had Forrest drawing 1-1 with my side Preston. This one sort of being a game of two halves for the first half. Preston definitely had the better of it, certainly with the chances going forward. Before Preston eventually took the lead, Billy Bowden had a good chance. DJ had a good chance. Josh Harrop had one saved as well. Samba, the Nottingham Forest goalkeeper, really was popping up with some decent saves in that first half. But eventually, after some excellent footwork, Billy Bowden did give North End the lead going into half time. And considering Preston were playing without a recognised striker, we were playing Alan Brown, an attacking midfielder at right back, Joe Rafferty, a right back at left back. I thought we were playing very well. We did very well in that first half. For the second off our intensity dropped off a little bit and Nottingham Forest definitely came on to us a little bit more. I thought the changes that they did make affected the game, you know, bringing on Jao Carvalho who got the assist for the goal and Doma who went on to score brilliantly threaded ball through from Jao Carvalho. But apart from the goal and the Joe Lolly chance after that, Forest weren't really at the races for this one. North End had a decent chance to win it near the end with a free kick from Brad Potts but that was safely into the hands of Samba the goalkeeper. So in the end finishing as a 1-1 draw, it's not the worst result in the world especially given some of North End's injuries at the moment. It was just a bit of a shame that we couldn't keep up that intensity from the first half because I thought we played quite well then. And Charlton continued their impressive run of form with a 2-0 away victory at Reading which sees them go into the automatic promotion places in the international break. Now what a start to the season it has been from Charlton. I think that they are just proving people wrong, myself included, week in week out. For the first half Reading had some decent chances. You know they hit the bar, Puskas had a one-on-one. -on -one. Things just weren't quite clicking for them but the second half Charlton were absolutely excellent. They were getting in some really good positions off the ball, they were working very hard and they, they got quality on the ball. You know they got some brilliant midfielders in there. Johnny Williams, as he always has been very influential for them, but uh, Jonathan Lecco, after a deflected effort, gave Charlton the lead in the 51st minute, and then after Chuck Zanicki had been bundled down in the penalty area, Lyle Taylor stepped up from the penalty spot to make it 2-0 to Charlton. I'm still loving Lyle Taylor's penalties, by the way. Just so cool and composed, walking up to the ball, and then sending the goalkeeper the wrong way to make it 2-0 to Charlton. Swift had the free kick go very close after that, but Charlton, well worth their three points with how they played in the second half, and uh, fair play to them, you know, long may it continue. They may QPR beating Sheffield Wednesday by two goals to one. Jordan Hugel is a man banging form at this point in time and seems to be back to his Preston days, you know. I think it will be fair to say that he didn't have the most successful loan spell last season out to Middlesbrough, but so far he just seems to really click into this QPR system that they like to play with. It was the home side though, Sheffield Wednesday, who did take the lead, Stephen Fletcher, from the penalty spot. I've watched the penalty back a few times and to me it looks very soft. 
But even so, QPR were able to turn it around in the second half. A brilliant through ball from Necky Wells into Jordan Hugel, who was able to get around the on rushing Kieran Westwood to make it 1 1. And then just four minutes later than that, a nice attacking move from QPR saw Jordan Hugel put away his second of the game. Sheffield Wednesday for this one, not the best performance from them once again. It's been a little bit of an indifferent start to the season for Sheffield Wednesday with three wins and three losses. I'm interested to see what happens with their managerial situation over the international break because I do think there are a few things that they need to work on. QPR, though, going into the international break, I think it's been a very positive start to the season from them. I've been impressed on the whole. They've played some good football so far. And then we have West Brom beating Blackburn by three goals to two. A really dramatic game. Blackburn took the lead in this one after just 25 seconds. West Brom were caught out playing it out from the back. Bradley Dack was able to pounce on that, getting his first goal of the season and putting Blackburn one nil ahead. But West Brom reacted really well to that after going behind. Pereira, someone who was looking absolutely fantastic for this game. Created more chances than anyone else in the championship this weekend. He set up the first goal, sending Matt Phillips to own goal, who was able to hold off Greg Cunningham to make it 1-1. Jake Livermore then perfectly slotted away from outside the box to make it 2-1 and then Diane Garner made it 3-1 with a brilliant finish a chip over Walton I think that him and Pereira could really do some damage for West Brom this season and given more time to link up throughout the season that could be a really good partnership Bloodburn did then get back into it before half time Bradley Johnson making it 3-2 after a bit of a fumble from Sam Johnson but they just couldn't get anything over the line in the second half so a good win for West Brom and a good way for them to go into the international break I still think we yet to see the best of them so far this season to be honest but with them sat fourth it's been a good start for them and then to finish the video off, we saw Wigan drawing nil-nil with Barnsley this weekend. A point not really doing either side too many favours. Wigan in the relegation zone for the international break. Barnsley just above it. Although, both sides, I think, did raise their performances from recent weeks. You know, we saw them having a couple more chances and looking a bit better going forward. But even so, neither side getting on the score sheet. Probably each team's best chances actually came from free kicks. In the first half, they both went close, but both goalkeepers were on hand to save the day. From open play, it was a little bit scrappy and the game was getting bogged down in midfield for a little bit. And possibly the international break now will be a good time for both sides to carry on bedding in some of the new players that they brought in over the summer and manage to get a bit more consistency going forward. Barnsley's Ben Williams was showing a red card in stoppage time for a ridiculous challenge. I'm not quite sure what he was trying to do really but it was an awful foul on Lee Evans and he was rightly sent off but finishing as a 0-0 draw didn't really do either side too many favours. But guys there you have it. There were all the games that were taking place this weekend. So as always do get your thoughts in the comments down below as to what you made of your side's performance. In terms of my result of the weekend it's going to have to go to Swansea for beating Leeds by one goal to nil which does send them to the top of the championship and then for my goal of the weekend I think I'm going to go for Grosicki just because it was a bit outrageous the free kick he scored against Millwall but apart from that guys that will now wrap it up for this video so if you're going to enjoy make sure you leave a like it is always massively appreciated as well as that make sure you subscribe for some regular championship content but apart from that thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one